Let's uh, get started um, and let me welcome you to the uh, spring um, 2014 CNI member meeting and to St. Louis. Uh, I hope that your travels here were not um, too onerous and I'm delighted that uh, so many of you have been able to join us for this meeting. I'm Cliff Lynch, uh, the director of CNI for those I've not had an opportunity to meet yet. And um, I'll be part of uh, the plenary, more on that in just a minute. I do have just a few housekeeping sorts of announcements uh, that I want to begin with. Um, first, as I say, I want to welcome everybody here. I want to particularly welcome our uh, international participants, uh, some of whom have come a very long way to be here. We're Glad you're here, and we're particularly uh, appreciative of those of you who are um, presenting here, uh, both um, from uh, the States and uh, from abroad. Um, it's great to have you all here. I would like to welcome um, three new members since our last meeting, the University of Ottawa, um, Carly, the Consortium of Academic and Research Libraries in Illinois, and a rejoining member of the National Institutes of Health Library. Um, welcome all. I also um, want to uh, welcome some folks who are here um, primarily for some um, satellite events on Wednesday, the uh, Digital Preservation Network meeting and the Digital Scholarship Workshop that uh, CNI is putting on. Um, we're glad that um, you were able to join us uh, for those. A couple words on the hotel. Um, you should have information on wireless in your packet. If you have any questions on that, um, uh, the registration desk can help you out. Um, you should also be getting uh, free wireless in your room, those of you who are um, staying here as part of the CNI block. Um, other than this room, which will host um, both the opening and closing plenaries and several breakout sessions, and the room immediately next to us, which is going to house our reception tonight and our um, breakfast and lunch tomorrow, all of the other meeting rooms here are on the second floor. Um, the second floor can be reached either by the stairs in the lobby, um, uh, that kind of grand staircase uh, off the center of the first floor lobby, or by elevators. Um, it's, just, it's just numbered as the second floor. Uh, we will have our afternoon break today down here, however. So um, if you're uh, feeling, <coughs> excuse me, the need for cookies later, um, uh, you will need to come back downstairs to the um, uh, pre-function area here for them. So far, I am delighted to say we've had no schedule changes. Um, I think overall, um, the weather's been a little less exciting than December, um, although not without its uh, occasional thrill. Um, if we do have schedule changes, they will be posted on the board um, uh, that is by the registration desk. So um, keep your eye on that. And now, with those announcements done, um, I want to move on to the, um, the main uh, part of the session, uh, which is a plenary. And we've decided to try something a little different today. Um, Brian Alexander, the man with the boot, um, is uh, going to be uh, doing our plenary this afternoon but he's going to do it in the form of a conversation with me. Um, and I'll kibitz a little bit here and there as well, uh, rather than just um, uh, standing here and um, doing a talk. Um, Brian, I think, is well known to many of you. He's um, a person with a lot of dimensions. He's um, been a um, professor of English. He's 
uh, been deeply involved in instructional technology and um, things at kind of the intersection of teaching, learning, and technology for many years. He's been a um, both both an uh, an active adopter and an um, insightful observer of what's been going on with the um, evolution of social media and um, how that ties into teaching and learning. Brian and I, it turns out, have a lot of common interests, although we also um, are um, enormously different in um, various um, various aspects of uh, the way we approach things. So I'm hoping this will be kind of a fun conversation. Um, I will also say that uh, when we chatted a little bit a few weeks ago to um, not really to prepare this so much as just to map out a few milestone topics we didn't want to miss, we realized that we really had a lot to talk about, um, I think. And so what we've done is, um, we, after this plenary, we are going to have a follow-on session in the four to five slot. This is, I'm sorry, the five to six slot, the end of the day slot, just before the um, reception. Um, it's listed in your book as one of the breakouts. And that will be primarily an opportunity um, for um, us to field questions and observations and perhaps even pushback from uh, members of the audience who want to continue that. Um, we'll try and get at least um, maybe one or two questions from the audience in, in this plenary, but um, uh, I'm not optimistic we'll get more than that just because of the uh, number of interesting things that um, uh, I think we want to hear um, Brian's thinking on. So um, I won't um, bore you with the details of his biography. That's all um, in the program book or on our webpage or linked to it. Um, uh, but instead, I'm going to go sit down and uh, launch the conversation. Uh, while I do that, please welcome Brian. Thank you very much. I appreciate the very kind introduction, and uh, I appreciate the chance to look out at you. You look like about eight people with two giant blurs of light over your heads. <laughs> so if I can't make full eye contact with you, it's because I haven't gone blind. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think this is a lot of fun, especially because, uh, Cliff, you have this habit of doing these wonderful opening speeches that have no notes, no PowerPoint, and uh, contain an awful lot of information. So as someone who spends a lot of time with Prezi and PowerPoint, this is a bit of a thrill. So <laughs> I do have 19th century technology here. I've got some paper and a pen, okay. which I will be using to make notes. Mm -hmm. 19th century technology has its place, it does. indeed. It does. Um, I think maybe a good place to start um, would be with the broad um, area of online learning. I mean, I know that so much of your work, particularly in uh, recent years, has been deeply involved in online learning. And, um, you know, we, we've had so much activity there um, uh, and um, so many, um, you know, boom and bust kind of ideas. Uh, uh, remember just a year or so ago, MOOCs were going to mm -hmm. conquer the world and reconfigure higher education. Um, uh, I think there were things in there that were important, but there's also a lot of hype going on. Um, I think that, um, you know, in a way they were particularly unfortunate because um, they aggregated a bunch of ideas, some of which were really about how we teach and some of which were much more about economics and um, uh, access to education broadly and things like that. Um, uh, that it really has, conf it really confused the conversation in a number of ways. Thank so you. let me ask you, just to start out, where do you think we are? And, and think in terms of, you know, the, the sort of broader tapestry of online learning, not purely MOOCs. Well, I think uh, I knew that the MOOC bubble had burst when Tom Friedman announced that they were the next big <laughs> thing. 
And I thought that kind of told the whole mm -hmm. world, oh, it's doomed. If the mustache mm -hmm. guy says it must be, mm -hmm. um, it must be over. Um, the MOOC, uh, MOOCs are in what Gartner calls now, I think, the, in between the trough of disillusionment and the plateau of productivity. Uh, we, there was a very, very high profile loss and Sebastian Thrun backed out of the academic world and moved instead to corporate learning. And for many people, that seems to have represented MOOCs on the downhill slide, that they're now shrinking. The opposite is true. Uh, Coursera, EDX, all these other MOOC providers are still busily offering more and more courses, enrolling more and more students. And so we can study that and see how big it is. And, and there are a few facets that I want, I want to pull out. One is that we're seeing a very, very deep two cultures divide in the MOOCosphere or in the world of MOOCs. That is, if you go with C.P. Snow's formulation, we're seeing a huge presence of STEM fields in sciences, math, and technology. And we're seeing relatively little in the humanities, as well as in the social sciences that are not so quantitatively demanding. So that skew is pretty interesting. I mean, there's some great humanities MOOCs out there, but not many um, represented. The second thing that we're seeing that I think is a real success is that MOOCs are definitely a global phenomenon. I mean, they tend to, within each nation, track rapidly for age, education, and income. But if you're an American citizen taking a MOOC, you're usually in the minority. I mean, no one nation outdoes the US in its MOOC desire. Uh, some come close, India, Brazil, China. But that wonderful global nature, I think, is a, something to be celebrated. They're running into bad problems. Uh, there's no uh, economic sustainability pattern that we have, you know, unless you think institutional subvention is uh, sustainable, which it really isn't. Now, Yale's recently former president just headed out to take over one of the MOOC platforms. And I think one, I don't know for sure, but I suspect one of the reasons he did this as an economist was to crack the nut of sustainability to see if he could make these actually pay for themselves. Uh, we'll see. Another problem which may impact some of you at a more visceral level is that we're not seeing a lot of incorporation of MOOCs within academia. We're not seeing a lot of credits being granted. And in fact, one of the O's in MOOCs, in open, we're not seeing that open content being remobilized and incorporated inside of curriculum or inside of classes. That's partly because a lot of these MOOCs aren't really open. You know, they, they're open for a time, then they go away, or they're limited in some other fashion. But uh, these, are, these are pretty big challenges. I, I think we can take a look at MOOCs alongside the distance learning offerings coming from many other campuses. So, I mean, you think about Penn State uh, World University, or you think about Southern New Hampshire University doing an awful lot of online teaching and learning that we used to call distance learning, and now we simply call online learning. Perhaps in 10 years, we'll simply call teaching. But those guys are beavering along with an interesting business model that's largely based on part-time staff, kind of like the American Professoriate. Um, and based on a really interesting technology basis. So they are going. But when we have that combination of MOOCs, which are all shiny and media buzzy, with distance learning, we're seeing a kind of dialectical opposition where a lot of campuses are saying, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to offer distance learning. We're not going to jump on the MOOC boat. Instead, we're going to blend we're going to do some form of hybrid learning or even flipping the classroom. So we're going to take the best of online learning, the best of the digital world, and incorporate it into the best of our face-to-face -face learning, which we, as every institution says, do better than anyone. And then to have that hybrid be a kind of response to distance learning, I mean, that's, I think, in many ways, the big picture. And you watch these two push against each other. So, so one could easily imagine taking one of the MOOC platforms software uh -huh. platforms, uh -huh. building content into it that's really intended for a reasonable size blended yeah. class that yeah. you're teaching within the context of, uh, uh -huh. for, you know, of today's um, uh, economics and credit structures and uh -huh. courses in a you really should be university. Able to. Yeah. I mean, and, and the content items, the, the quizzes, the handouts, the PowerPoint presentations, the video mm -hmm. clips should really be dual purpose. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think if you look at some of the, sorry, a bit of terminology, how many of you are familiar with the X MOOC versus C MOOC distinction? <sighs> hasn't caught on, hasn't caught on. So w these are prefixes lowercase. So when you hear X MOOC, the X refers to EDX. It refers to the MOOCs that you usually think of, the ones that are very large, hundreds of thousands of learners, predominantly video content, 
there's a social layer, but it's kind of awkward. It's either in discussion boards or nothing at all. Uh, and those are usually the ones you think of from Coursera, EDX, Udemy, Udacity, that kind of thing. CMOOC, C stands for either Canadian or connectivist, uh, because that was where the first MOOCs came from, both Canada and for classic connectivism. These tend to be smaller, merely 10,000 learners. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be really predicated on social media and to adopt a constructivist pedagogy. And they tend to be much more militant about being open. So the open content there really is dual mm -hmm. purpose. Interesting. I, th I think you're right to bring up the, the media cycle for this, that it bring, we had such a hype cycle when MOOCs were gonna transform everything, destroy higher education. I think Sebastian Thrun said there are gonna be 10 universities left. Oh, yes. and, uh, and then I think that made sense for a lot of media. They, they wanted to run with that story. And I think it's unfortunate that some of the great ideas are there. Uh, Jim Groom from the University of Mary Washington, the creator of the DS-106 MOOC, has this interesting observation. He argues that MOOCs, both CMOOCs and XMOOCs, are the first web-native form of distance learning and online learning. That every other form until that point had been a porting of offline learning into the online world. You think about the virtual classroom with all the assumptions of that, and that MOOCs are the first to say, wow, you know, our scale is huge. To take the web seriously as a delivery platform and as a social platform. So I think that idea is one that we really want to hold on to, even if MOOCs are in a dark stage right now. Actually, that's a, that's a very striking kind of metaphor to me, and it's one that I'd not heard before. Um, it certainly brings up um, you know, echoes of uh, what's happened as we've tried to move various forms of scholarly communication to the mm -hmm. web and mm -hmm. um, done it sometimes in an enormously superficial kind of a way yes. without rethinking any of the affordances or opportunities. Or going the exact opposite way. You think of uh, not in scholarly communication, but overdrive for public libraries with its, you know, you can only check out one copy because they only have mm -hmm. one available. I mean, yeah. deliberately, it's, it's, a, it's a squeam morph. I mean, really mm -hmm. trying to, you know, uh, have a, a steam-powered database <laughs> or something. So uh, let, me, um, let me try out another thought on, <clears throat> you know, I, I'm, I'm realizing that there's a kind of a, um, language abuse here because one wants to talk about the software platforms that are used for MOOCs uh -huh. separately from the idea of a MOOC itself. Because uh -huh. um, uh, I think we're going to see those software platforms used in lots of different ways. Indeed, we already are in the case we talked about with the uh -huh. blended classrooms. But, um, you know, one of the, the striking, to me, evident fallacies we've seen is this equivalencing of MOOC platform with something to deliver a course on, as opposed to ways of providing training on topics or methodologies sure. or things sure. that don't merit a full you know, semester course, but um, you want to provide this to a lot of people. Um, I'm surprised that they're not being used as you know, another way of flexibly delivering sure. education or knowledge about specific topics that ought to be part of, say, a, um, you know, a, a graduate program in business mm -hmm. or something like that, but doesn't fit in one of the courses. That's true. It recalls the old learning object yeah. idea. Just uh, at a slightly bigger scale. Well, you think if you're offering a MOOC and mm -hmm. you are not automatically part of a campus schedule, if the registrar isn't dictating the size and the shape of your class, then in theory, there's no restriction. There's no even guidance on the size of, of your MOOC. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about podcasts, which can be one minute long or two hours long. A MOOC can be one week. It could be mm -hmm. a whole year long. Mm -hmm. And you see that with CMOOCs, where mm -hmm. once they go and they finish their cycle, the participants will keep MOOCing along. They'll keep talking and sharing thoughts and using hashtags. I mean, there's a sense where you can just kind of break out of the, the course structure, mm -hmm. the class unit. Maybe even get out away, get away from the Carnegie Seed classification too. So maybe maybe ultimately we see some of these C MOOCs evolving into um, communities of study and interest that okay. um, have a have a sort of a strong social aspect and could persist for very long times. 
I think that's quite possible. We we're already seeing part of this with the DS-106 digital storytelling class, mm -hmm. which is now probably the world's most visible digital storytelling community online. There's also a British uh, digital photography scene move called Phonar, which is, has a lot of digital photography enthusiasts, and they tend to participate past that. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how much energy these have going forward. I mean, can they really use the grounding in social media, or would the software platform be the place for them to continue? So c can you um, imagine a s future where we see um, cultural heritage institutions picking up these sorts of things, you know, trying to mobilize a community of people who share a common interest around, um, I don't know what, you know, opera of some sort sure. or of, um, you know, Roman antiquities or something. Uh. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there's no reason, there's, there's no institutional requirement for offering a MOOC, for example. Yeah. And if the platforms are available, anyone can make use of them. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to make a MOOC about baking bread, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't have a degree in culinary arts, I have a lot of experience in baking. No reason for me not to start doing that mm -hmm. right now, much like web publishing mm -hmm. as a whole. Um, but I think for libraries and museums, this kind of web venue is very, very powerful mm -hmm. to show off an exhibit. Mm -hmm. Uh, a unique collection or an approach. And the question is, can a library or a museum make the case internally mm -hmm. for its sustainability? Can they say that this may garner us mm -hmm. no cash flow at all, uh, but it's terrific publicity? I mean, I, I think thinking through this is a good first step of thinking about 3D printing for libraries and for museums, mm -hmm. where they're beginning to wonder, on the one hand, will 3D printing be a good way to advertise what we have if people can download and print a 3D copy of a sculpture that we have or a tapestry? Or is it a dire threat where people will print that and never come to the museum or library and they all die? I mean, so that, I mean, thinking through that, that web channel will give us a good venue going forward, I think. So, so slipping over briefly to, um, <clears throat> to uh, social media to maybe close out some of the conversations on online learning, um, one of the things that really strikes me is um, there's a challenge, especially in these areas like cultural heritage institutions, where you would position a MOOC versus various other kinds of web or social media. You know, do you put your resources there? Do you put it in into a Facebook uh, page instead, or do you go with a blog um, uh -huh. or? You know, do you do all of them and try and tie them together, which starts getting expensive it does. in terms it does. of staff time? Well, in many ways, it's a, it's a question of audience. Mm -hmm. And what we can do now is rely on a lot of studies of how people are using social media. Um, I'm just looking at the audience here. Quick show of hands. How many of you are on Twitter? Whoa. Okay, how many of you are on Twitter right now? <laughs> 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 We've got to catch up on. Uh, mm -hmm. How many of you are on Google Plus? Wow, very nerdy audience, excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, how many of you are on Pinterest? How many of you are male and on Pinterest? <laughs> very good, very good. Um, and just, just, I have to ask this, how many of you are on Facebook? Oh, it looks almost like more on Twitter than on Facebook, that's interesting. Well, I'm asking in part because then I don't have to explain all these different platforms to you. Um, but if you take a look at studies like, say, the Pew Internet and American Life study of how people are using these different media, you can see some interesting patterns. I mean, one is that people do seek news more on Twitter than on any other platform. People tend to do shopping more on Pinterest than any other platform, etc. You can break these down bit by bit. I mean, you can think about demographics of the ages that are using these. Um, if you're ever worried, for example, about being generation gap by teenagers, tell them about LinkedIn. Because <laughs> the average age of a LinkedIn user is roughly 50. Mm -hmm. So it's that, you know, it's the geezer net, right? We're the ones who use it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then, but you think about your, your, your audience. I mean, in all seriousness, if I were talking to a classical symphony, I would think about asking them to look at LinkedIn because their demographics skew older. If I was trying to do a lot of online marketing, oh, sorry, a lot of online commerce for museum, I would definitely set the Pinterest board right away and see where that goes. 
if I wanted to push something that was more newsy, if I had a library collection on something like, say, bioinformatics thing I wanted to show, then maybe you know, Twitter would be the place to go. Um, a MOOC would be a very, very different place. You'd want to evoke the class and course paradigm. So people wouldn't dive in to learn informally, they dive in to learn formally. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be there to shop or to get a quick dose of information, they'd be there for the long haul. And in that case, you know, you'd want to see who would be willing to do that. Uh, I've just finished the MOOC that's being run by the University of Virginia mm -hmm. on the age of Thomas Jefferson. And part of that was showing off Monticello, which is a lot of fun just to see that and to have a lecture on Jefferson being given in Monticello. That's pretty exciting. So you can imagine, among other things, a lot of the lectures talked about UVA as Jefferson's dream child. That's a kind of advertising uh, for their physical site mm -hmm. as well as for the institutional site. You'd wonder I mean, where a library would actually see that. So I, I think there's no one answer right now. I think it's a question of strategy and choice. Mm -hmm. And as you say, of resources. Some of these can be expensive in terms of time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I appreciate your um, mention of the uh, Pew Internet and American Life um, mm -hmm. studies. Uh, those really have become a wonderful resource in trying to understand how people are using various um, uh, services on the web today. Um, well, they're, they're very meticulous, yeah. very uh, data-driven, and also longitudinal. Mm -hmm. So you can track when the majority of Americans finally mm -hmm. had smartphones because they were tracking that for years. Yep. Uh, and they're uh, also very, they're open. They're easily accessible for everybody. Yeah. Um, let's, let's turn not away from online education, but delve into a couple of other areas because uh, I'm mindful of our time. Um, <coughs> so another thing that's clearly you know, shaking up everything is the proliferation of mobile devices of various kinds, which now has gone um, you know, beyond the individual devices to the establishment of you know, what are really genuinely device ecosystems. Uh -huh. um, uh, you know, some devices play good with other devices and services and others don't play nice. Um, and um, there's a certain amount of effort, I think, to um, wall people into various um, attractive uh, bits of, you know, nicely groomed ecosystem um, uh -huh. and making it hard to get outside. Uh -huh. um, where do you see that headed at this point? Um, I think we're in a giant battle uh, of architectures between, roughly speaking, open and closed. Mm -hmm. uh, we have many, many mobile devices that, as you say, are very attractive walled mm -hmm. gardens. Uh, I'm a serious Kindle addict, mm -hmm. and all I buy are Kindle books. I mean, I can port over mm -hmm. PDFs or Mobi files, but it's tedious, and the Kindle is simply very convenient, and I recognize that. Um, and that it gnaws at my open source heart. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. iOS is something similar. You know, you've got your uh, iPhone, your um, an iPad, then you have this beautiful world of multitude of apps and very expensive slash sexy hardware, and, and you're in good shape. You know, you're very comfortable there. Uh, Microsoft is trying this. No one is using it, but they're trying it. Mm -hmm. um, and then Android is weirdly caught in between, where they have a kind of open, kind of not platform. Uh, all of this is in many ways warring against the open web, which keeps growing, we keep using it, um, but as Sir Tim Berners-Lee tells us, it's not a web that we should count on being open without our, without our fighting it for it. I mean, over all of this, I mean, these are the consumer faces. We have the enormous revelations of, of Snowden mm -hmm. and of global sur surveillance, and we now have this phenomenon, surveillance fatigue. I mean, about three years ago, we had mm -hmm. financial crisis fatigue, mm -hmm. whereas every week there'd be another LIBOR is being rigged, uh, this bank is guilty, and we just got used to it. Mm -hmm. right? And now it's, oh, the NSA is spying on my children, of course they are. You know, just, we're just kind mm -hmm. of accustomed to this. Uh, the uh, uh, German press this week is very excited about more surveillance on German companies. Not internet companies, not digital companies, but simply ordinary enterprises done by British and American intelligence. And now we're, we're accustomed to this. It's simply part of, uh, part of life, which is extraordinary. 
Uh, I mean, we've, we've skipped 1984, headed right into Brave New World and embraced it uh, with open arms. So when we think about using mobile devices, that's beginning to come up. I mean, to what extent is my really excellent phablet, you know, uh, my Galaxy phablet, a uh, tracking device? Well, it's a terrific <laughs> tracking device. People can find me very easily, even if I don't tweet at all. Um, I think in academia, we have to reflect on this more broadly. We have to think about the engagement with surveillance, but also when it comes to open and closed, it's important for faculty and for deans and presidents, not to mention boards, to think about to what extent should an institution, be it a university, a library, a college, participate in one of these major architectures? Should, is it up to the university to embrace and push open? Should they have an open access mandate for scholarly publication? Mm -hmm. Should they try and encourage faculty to publish outside of LMSs and into the open web in, for certain purposes, you know, to contribute to the commonweal? Or should they strategically think, well, these walled gardens work. We like gardens, and they really succeed for us in various ways. And I, we're not having enough of a conversation outside of this room, you know, outside of the realm of instructional technology and libraries. We need to have that conversation at large. Yeah. And you know, this was a, an issue that higher ed particularly engaged very deeply um, uh, with desktop ecosystems oh, yes. a decade ago, and then ultimately, more than a decade ago now, yeah. and yeah. then ultimately kind of settled on the browser as mm -hmm. a key mm -hmm. uh, part of a strategy to yeah. open things up. Um, and you know, the, the ecosystem thing for traditional computers as opposed to these smaller mobile devices seems to have largely dissipated. But we don't seem to be having the same intensity of conversation now around the mobile ecosystems, even though, if anything, what's going on there may be more insidious. It is, um, it is more insidious, in, in part because the devices are so much more intimate and personal. It, exactly. And, and content is coming into play here, too. Uh -huh. um, you know, I ran across a number that just left my jaw hanging the other, um, the other week. So Amazon, a company that is notably unhelpful in providing statistics about um, its various activities yes. uh, beyond those that have to go in the financial reports, okay. um, actually put out a little press release of sort of highlights of um, uh, 2000... Um, 13, I believe it was, in which they stated that they had 200,000 exclusive, um, exclusively licensed to Amazon, licensed for sale through Amazon ebooks. Hmm. 200,000. That's 200,000 hmm. books hmm. Into, in one year um, that are basically exclusive to that channel and ecosystem. I wonder how many are in a similar position in iBooks, in the iBook store. I would guess it's very small. I mean, um, in terms great. of um, sort of just sheer diversity of content, it looks to me like, mm. um, although the numbers are very elusive, but it, 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 my sense is Amazon has won that one in books and... Um, uh, in music, although you know Apple, Apple has played different things. For example, they've done a lot with getting exclusives of popular um, music. new music, yeah. um, you know, extra tracks or uh -huh. exclusive pre-release sorts of things. The Beatles, that, the Beatles yeah. um, that play very well to their demographic true. and installed base. Very true. Um, so, you know, in terms of just absolute size of catalog, I think Amazon's probably far ahead. I think you're right. In terms of profitability, it may be another matter. But the principle they embody yes. is, is, is just so ruthless. Yes. And, and we've seen this in other hardware. I mean, it tends to be on gaming platforms. If you mm -hmm. use an Xbox, that software won't play on a GameCube mm -hmm. or anything else. Um, but I'm curious, if I look out at the audience, just raise your arm if you have a Fitbit. Huh, that's interesting. Raise your other arm if you don't know what a Fitbit is. <laughs> that's okay. 
Um, the reason I'm asking, a, a Fitbit is a little, little tiny piece of technology that sits on your body and you can clip it to a piece of clothing that rests against your skin or against your throat or on your wrist. And it monitors, the kinds you guys have right now, monitors your, um, your sleep and your feet, right? Your, your footsteps? Walking, right. And then you can take that Fitbit and it monitors, it gives you a little bit of feedback. Uh, and then you can plug it into a device and it'll give you charts and data so you get that whole quantified self-experience. But we think about that, that Fitbit doesn't play with the jawbone up. It doesn't play with other tools. It's totally a slick, very small walled garden, part of the ecosystem. In fact, I mean, right now we're beginning to add more and more devices. It used to be, if I go back to the 90s, that if you wanted to have an icon of computing, you'd have a desktop. Picture of the desktop stood for computing. And then in the first decade of the 21st century, it would be a laptop. And that kind of worked. And now we have no idea. And we have piles of devices because we have e-readers, we have portable game players, we still have tablets, we have all these different devices. And they kind of smear themselves around our personal space to different levels. And most of them run these narrow ecosystems that we have to depend on, which is really in many ways frightening. The browser stands kind of as the sole popular channel for access to open, mm -hmm. which is interesting that MOOCs rely so heavily on it, that we don't have a lot of MOOC apps, that instead that O for open has that little echo in the use of browsers. Uh, speaking of browsers, I wonder if you have a read on these, um, what to me look like really disturbing developments around HTML5 and the ability to effectively put DRM back into uh, the browser? I think these are very disturbing. Um, I think it's a sign that the copyright wars have been waging for some time and they're not going away. In fact, uh, my laptop over there, an otherwise very nice Lenovo, I don't know if any of you have experienced this, it will not let me record audio played by the laptop itself. See, if I speak into it with an attached mic, it'll record just fine. But if I play a YouTube video in one tab, and then I open Audacity to record it, nothing appears. <laughs> and this was obviously an innovation sparked by the creative geniuses of the Recording Industry Association of America, who wanted to make sure that I wouldn't be recording the next Lady Gaga or whatever. Um, and these people were very, very persistent. And I think for HTML5, this is a disaster. Just personally, we need to stop this right away. But we, we see the battle for this, for the, which IP model we have going forward, reaching huge areas. I mean, you're familiar with the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreements, mm -hmm. which are done largely in secret, and have huge IP thickening agreements, where it makes it easier for businesses to go after other countries for IP violations. I mean, I... I, I I hesitate to tell a room full of information and library professionals that copyright is a problem. I mean, obviously, duh. Um, but it, it, we keep, as we develop new technologies, the major IP industries keep figuring out new ways to, to control them. It, it goes back to less observation that this is not really about money. This is about power and control. Uh, the desire to keep you from doing these things. Yeah, I mean, the DRM thing just seems like, you know, it's this zombie that won't stay down. Um, uh, you know, things were going pretty well for a while. The, um, the music people kind of got over it um, and uh, started selling unencumbered digital yep. music. And, yep. uh, you know, p um, people who acquired that started having a much better experience with it than before. Um, the e the ebook people continue in large part to be obsessed with it, Very um, much. And, but uh, the video folks seem to be the you know most obsessed of all with it, uh -huh. um, and they just keep trying to slide it back in. Um, it's really remarkable. Well, video and film hasn't. Mm -hmm. People talk about music being Napsterized, and it, it really wasn't. I mean, Napster died. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what happened was that it drove them into iTunes. So you could say that music was iTunized, and that made it successful again. Mm -hmm. They don't like to say successful. They don't want to admit to that too much, but it's been very successful. Movies haven't had that similar move. I mean, they've got deals with Hulu, deals with Netflix, deals with Amazon, but they're constantly being renegotiated. They're not that successful in many ways. Meanwhile, the theater productions going face-to-face -face into a movie theater mm -hmm. have not been as lucrative. Yeah. They've been declining a bit. And after they invested a ton 
in 3D. Mm -hmm. That hasn't paid off very yeah. well. I, mean, one out of, I don't know, one out of 50 3D movies actually turned a profit yeah. that it wouldn't otherwise. And, and then you have the underlying pattern of, you know, trying to make every movie an expensive blockbuster. Exactly, uh, exactly. So. Uh, which, is, which is interesting because they see this may be a Christian so disruptive innovation moment because while you have that happening in the box office, you have so much in web video in YouTube and Blip yes. and Vimeo that is so creative. And as with podcasts, as with MOOCs, there's no limit on size. So people are shooting two hour, four hour, three minute movies and distributing them. I mean, and that's really, I, I don't know to what extent Hollywood fears this right now. When they do, we'll know. They'll start suing people and they'll start changing technology you know, right away. Interesting. I do want to come back to one more part about the device ecosystem, if I could. Oh, let's. How yes. many of you at your institutions have available at least one 3D printer? Good. Excellent. That's, that's good, yeah. How many of you that don't are thinking about it in this calendar year? Good, good. Uh, I mean, 3D printing is one of these innovations that simply slid into view and it's begun to shake up a lot of economics, a lot of art, a lot of creativity. I mean, there's already talk that we may be seeing a manufacturing mini revolution. There is a possibility that if consumers can print products that used to be shipped through container ships, that we may see a decline in international shipping or even a twist to globalization. I mean, if you don't have to buy a shirt or a pair of shoes or a book that's printed in South Korea or Mexico or Thailand, but you can print it from your own living room, that's an interesting change in globalization and economics. And we're just beginning to look into IP issues. I mean, I, I just love the idea of printing Mickey Mouse hats, for example. Keep doing this until the commanders descend on my house, right? Um, but we. We're, not to mention, we're looking at the implications of 3D printing in multiple areas. Some of you may have seen 3D printing in science. I don't mean in theory, but in printing uh, in Holland, a team of surgeons printed two-thirds of a woman's skull in plastic. She had terrible brain disease, and they basically had to replace chunks of her skull. So they're able to print out, with incredible precision, the skull pieces and reinsert them, and she's healthier. I mean, thinking about printing... Oh, yeah, these are being used routinely now, from what I understand, for mm -hmm. joint replacements in some cases. Which I may look forward to at some <laughs> point. Um, I mean, we're just beginning to see this transform things. I mean, what I'm waiting to hear happen, and you guys will hear this when the language changes, we now say camera, and we kind of assume it means video. You know, to have a, a camera only take pictures is a special kind of camera. Uh -huh. I'm waiting for printer to mean 3D printer. If it only prints paper, you have to give it a name. Oh, that's a, a paper printer. You know, it's kind of retro. <laughs> we bought that before the Hillary Clinton presidency. You know, it was back yeah. in the day. Uh, I mean, the other technology to think about is uh, is to think about. Um, I, I I love being able to say this. Is to think about the possibility of virtual reality. I mean. At the meta level, when we look at technology, some of them blow up, up here, and just leap forward. You know, think about Twitter. You think, I mean, some of these have very, very short curves, and some of these have long adoption curves. I mean, think of e-books, which date back. Has anyone here worked on Project Gutenberg? All right. Yes, I was a volunteer in the, in the 80s. In the 80s. And e-books didn't go mainstream until just about six years ago. I mean, you think of virtual reality, famously, was a big deal in the 90s. Its total collapse propelled Gerard Lanier to a career as a cranky old man of the internet. Mm -hmm. And then Facebook just spent, what, two billion? Yes. To say, Stunning. well, maybe virtual reality could go someplace. Uh, there's a lot of 90s nostalgia in this, but it might be that we see more people do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, the technology ecosystem keeps throwing up more and more yeah. pieces of hardware and more ecosystems as we go forward. And those of you in IT know that very rarely do they withdraw one of these. Very rarely do they say, stop supporting this one thing. Yeah. Stop using that one thing. <laughs> Word perfect, come on, you can still use it, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the earlier example you brought out of 3D printing um, is, what I've been watching as well, and it shows all the signs of um, connecting up with a whole complicated ecosystem of its own. 
because you've got the whole capture side of it too. Um, you know, how do you image an ob a 3D object so that you can print it out later? And the, things are advancing very fast in that area. Um, there's actually a, I'm forgetting the name of it, but there's a device that has two chambers, mm -hmm. scanner and printer. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you can put something in to have it scanned and then get it printed in the other. It's kind of like, to me, it reminds me of, uh, say, the um, transporter deck of the Star Trek Enterprise, you know, um, where you can, you can produce this. But, yeah. but that just happened, right? We're, yeah. we're producing more and more of this. Yeah, and, and you know, you, oh, I've seen um, some very interesting capture devices in the last few years. Mm -hmm. People are, for example, building these laser-based things that if you're interested in medieval churches, mm -hmm. you just drag it in, run it for a few hours, and you've got an image of the interior of the church mm -hmm. um, in three dimensions down to a real high degree of resolution. And then mm -hmm. if you want to make yourself a miniature uh, medieval church. Um, well, there was a great CNI presentation from yes. uh, a scholar does this. Yes. But let's just, let's just carry this a little forward into you know, the far future, say, you know, August or September, <laughs> and, and think mm -hmm. as... If, if all the trend lines keep going, if capturing technology gets easier and easier to use, it gets less and less expensive, it becomes more and more available, then when will we start seeing people walk into your museum, scan something mm -hmm. and walk out and then print it at home? When will they go to your campus and scan a beautiful building and print it at home? Uh, when will they come into your office mm -hmm. and do the same thing? I mean, it's, it, we're not really ready to start talking about no. this. I, you, you can see it with the hysteria around Google Glass, which is 95% hysteria. I mean, I, I love the idea people say, oh, no, he has Google Glass. He can record me. Like, what, what do you think yeah. we're carrying around? I mean, this, is, this isn't new. I mean, this is... Um, I mean, you know, really, if you can get any sense of perspective on it, the marriage of cameras and mm -hmm. you know, portable phones incredible disruptive technology, you know, the, you speak of the museums, and yes, people are doing this now yep. for two-dimensional things. Uh, somebody sees a citation they're interested in, a, uh -huh. you know, an image of something, snaps a picture. Uh -huh. um, you know. Or whiteboards, right? Yeah, you have, you have whiteboard exactly. Discussion. I was just at the uh, St. Louis City Museum, which if you haven't gone, I really recommend. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary museum. It's a uh, I don't think there's anything like it in the U.S. Museum people here can help me out, but what they've done is they've just taken an old shoe factory, turned it into a museum, and all the content is ruins and remnants of St. Louis that they've captured and curated and represented in different ways. Some as bona fide museum historical spots, some as children's exhibits. I mean, it's a lot of fun. But walking through there with my camera, I had to go back to the front desk and say, <clears throat> Do you mind if I take pictures? <laughs> What's mm -hmm. your policy? And they say, oh, do whatever you want. Go ahead. And thanks for asking. Uh, but I don't think we've caught up with this. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you think about if you go into uh, a changing room mm -hmm. or a bathroom, sometimes there'll be a policy to not use your cell phone, which isn't about the problem of people using cell phones when they're on the toilet. I love that problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, that seems to be universal. You know, there's someone you call and it's always raining, right? But, mm -hmm. but the... <laughs> The, it's, about, it's about privacy, of taking pictures when people are, are in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. We haven't gone to this. If you go to a medical hospital or a clinic, I just love looking at the permissions when I can use cell phones or not, because they never have anything to do with the actual technology. It has to do with malpractice and how paranoid the people running it are. And they'll have these weird little demarcations. On the first floor, you can use the technology, but not on the second floor until the blue line. And they're just making it up, really. Uh, we're, we haven't yet begun the part. Oh, well, you and I, we're talking here, and we didn't tell everybody, uh, don't record this. Mm -hmm. Or if you do, get Brian's good side. Or, you know, we, we, just, we haven't really assumed this yet. Um, and we have to, because the technology is rapidly outpacing our mores. Oh, yeah, and um, I, I think, you know, we underestimate how rapidly it is. One of the things I've been following, and it's going to tie back into this 3D business again, is uh -huh. the rise of what I guess I'd call sort of computational photography. Uh -huh. These things uh -huh. where you can, you know, image something and then decide where the focal point is later, <laughs> computationally. Can you um, do it with two focal points or just one? Uh, you can move it around. Oh, awesome. Um, awesome. Or, or these assemblers, things like um, 
what was it, Photosynth that Microsoft mm -hmm. did. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, these are remarkable extensions of our traditional ideas about yes. photography that, among other things, take us into something that's much more like 3D, yes. um, you know, space capture and representation. Maybe Oculus Rift is the way forward. Maybe. I mean, we can experience that. We already do this in gaming. You know, which is the world's probably second biggest culture industry. Mm -hmm. We love diving into that. We love having incredibly rich um, worlds that are 2D, 3D. Mm -hmm. you know, we experience three-dimensional television. Let me see. Does anybody here own a 3D TV? And you don't regret it? <laughs> <laughs> Larry! <laughs> there very few hands went up. You know, 3D TV hasn't, hasn't taken off. You know, but, but we love the 2D, 3D immersion mm -hmm. of worlds. And if you think about it, there's a... Uh, Ted Castronova, the uh, economist mm -hmm. studies games, had this great equation. He said, all right, I can take my kids, go to a movie theater for two hours, spend, what, $50, and have entertainment. Or I can go home, spend $50 on a first-run A-rated game, and have 60 hours of entertainment. It's really not a fair comparison mm -hmm. at all, is it? Uh, I, I, I think maybe you're onto something with computational three-dimensional mm -hmm. photography. Well, I am realizing that we have 10 minutes left, and... Did they get to talk? Um, I think what we're gonna do is, I'm gonna ask you two more questions, sure. um, and um, uh, we're gonna save most of the questions from them. Maybe we'll get one in for our breakout session, because um, I, I, these are both sort of open-ended questions. So. Um, we talked a little bit about some of the um, technology areas that you're tracking, like 3D printing and, and related issues. Um, what, give me two or three other things that are sort of on your, you know, I'm tracking this because it may be a serious game changer kind of technology, and they don't have to be ones you're sure are going to happen, but could... Well, the, the biggest one isn't yeah. the technology. Um, mm -hmm. Really, it's a conflict of demographics and economics. Can I take mm -hmm. a whack at that? Sure. Um, we're, we're witnessing, by the way, please don't use the phrase perfect storm. I just want to outlaw that for at least a year. Yeah. I mean, people use it to mean coincidence or something that happened on Earth. No, no, no. Perfect Moratorium storm is, on that. Yeah. No, it's, it's overblown. But, but what we're watching is a confluence of, of factors that are beginning to change higher education in ways that are enormously, enormously dangerous in some ways. Um, you probably know that most of the U.S. is experiencing a demographic shortfall in the population aged 1 to 18. When you look at the Northeast, you look at the Midwest especially, that population is shrinking. Those regions are being looked more and more like Japan demographically. In the South, most of the Southeast, most of the American South, is seeing a similar decline with the exception of Texas and Florida. In the West, we're barely seeing growth at all. This has huge, huge impacts on K through 12, as some of you know already. And it's beginning to hit traditional age undergraduate education. Meanwhile, the total number of students enrolled in American higher education, graduate and undergraduate, went down for the past two years. I mean, not as a proportion, but the total number went down. On top of that, the amount of money that Americans spent on higher education also went down, not just because fewer of us were going. And for various reasons, I don't have to tell you about the economy, and also, but it's worth thinking about people in their 20s who are facing an ever more frightening world with the specter of debt. I use the word specter advisedly, because it really isn't part, partly hype and partly fear but also a very bad job market. I mean, it's possible, some economists say, this may be the first generation to be less well-educated than their parents and to have less of lifetime earning. I mean, all of that, all of that is placing enormous pressure on public institutions. Public institutions that have been seeing their state support cut so far that they are in many ways almost de facto private institutions. All of this combined with policy pressure where you know, we have the Democratic Party leading the charge to bring higher ed to heal, right? You know, by imposing, imposing a rating system on us and by trying to get us to reduce prices. I mean, this combination is a really, really scary mix. And it's already beginning to show forth in some disturbing situations. I mean, for example, we're seeing mid-rank uh, public institutions cutting departments like classics or math or American studies. 
and laying off tenured faculty or tenured track faculty as a result simply because they're facing terrible, terrible numbers crunches. We're hearing talk about colleges merging campuses in order to save money and achieve economies of scale. I mean, this is something that I, I'm, I'm tracking closely, especially when I talk to trustees and presidents, because this is the kind of, huh, maybe it is a perfect storm, but this is the kind of tremendous pressure that, that is really hammering all of us very hard. And when we look at technology, the, the responses are weird. Sometimes an institution decides, well, technology can save us. MOOCs are a cost-effective way to deliver education. They really aren't, but they'll look that way. Or the reverse, maybe we should go back to our core mission of faculty and staff, but with less money spent on IT or less money in academic computing. I mean, I was tracking gaming and education, and one of the reasons why that moves so slowly is because it doesn't look like it's very cost effective. It doesn't look like a really good use of money, a good core use of money. Mm. I mean, you know, when I look around at all of your faces, I mean, no one is smiling what I'm saying, in part because you recognize this. Um, many of you are facing this, depending on where you are geographically, institutionally. So that, you can call this the higher education bubble, as some call it. Uh, I have a piece coming out inside higher ed called Peak Higher Education, question mark. Thinking about the possibility that maybe America has reached a kind of maximum carrying capacity of Americans that we can put in colleges and universities. And then we have to figure out what to do on the downhill side of that. Those are major trends I'm looking at. Yeah, and certainly, um, I mean, you see ramifications of that in amazing places. Uh, I mean, one of the um, really ha genuinely hard to get your head around uh, stories, at least for me, that I've been following is, um, the Detroit Art Institute, mm, mm, absolutely. Um, where they're absolutely. basically, the city's bankrupt and uh, yeah. they're trying to decide whether they can or should uh, more le legally or required to mm -hmm. have a fire sale of uh, mm -hmm. all of the um, goodies in the Detroit Art Institute. This is you know, tremendous amount Who of would money. have imagined that 10 years ago? Well, it, it um, kind of it echoes back yeah. to our discussion about museums expanding into social media because the majority of users, the majority of patrons of the DIA are people from out of town. You know, that's one angle of the discussion. Um, but to think about this, I mean, this is, it's a good thing we're in economic recovery or else things would be really bad, right? <laughs> I think um, uh, the, other, the other thing that I've been um, looking really carefully at is uh, the real move into social media by academics. Uh, which is really astonishing because it doesn't get a lot of press. It doesn't show many places. But right now, it's hard, you're hard-pressed to find an academic discipline that doesn't have massive representation of faculty and grad students in the blogosphere. I mean, you look at some disciplines like economics, mm -hmm. and the furious discussions happening at the scholarly level are actually changing the discipline right now. And partly, it's because the price point of social media is so awesome. Mm -hmm. That zero is pretty good. But also because it's a way that kind of as Dan Cohen says, to, to rebuild the community of scholars, you know, where people can then try out ideas. They can blog up a concept or a discovery. I and mean, that's something which we really need to celebrate mm -hmm. and pay a lot more attention to. Yeah, it's really a tremendous development. Um, and, and again, one that you, re you really have to look over like sort of a five to 10 year time horizon yes. to recognize the scale of the impact yes. on that. Yeah. All right, last question for you, and this is one we didn't talk about before, but um, uh, might be an easy one. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a little um, preface for it. I, have a, I believe you are a science fiction reader. Yes. Um, I believe this is one of the um, ailments that we uh, share. Um, it's and very necessary. of course, people who are interested in the future and thinking about the future, tend to be drawn here and to find science fiction books that um, you know, have given them a, a new perspective on the future from time yes. to time. Yes. Um, I was trying to think of one that I'd read recently um, that did that and actually had to go trawling back a couple of years, believe it or not. Mm. Um, so I don't know whether that means I'm reading the wrong things or uh, they're just not talking to me, or science fiction is going to the dogs, or what? But it have is. you read one lately that has yeah. 
changed um, your thinking about the future a bit? There's, there's, uh, there's several. There's one I was going to recommend in particular. But just to preface it, it's especially if you have teenage children, you'll know that we're going through a massive love affair with dystopia. <laughs> that we, we are joyously destroying the world and, and relishing it. You know, we have uh, zombies, we have meteors. We're very fond of this. And, and Hollywood has figured this out, and they're showering us with the ends of the world where you know, everything looks just horrible, and we love it, we love it to pieces, which is fascinating. I mean, it says something about our times, but we're also seeing a pushback. There's actually a movement to have optimistic science fiction, which is very small, but how many of you have read Rainbow's End uh, by Werner Vinge? Oh, good, good. I mean, that's one that I would, I would strongly mm -hmm. recommend. The, the plot, this is an award-winning science fiction novelist who's also a scientist and a fascinating guy. The plot conceit is interesting that, uh, in the near future, we have managed a cure for Alzheimer's. And a man, the protagonist, a poet, has his Alzheimer's cured. Unfortunately, while his brain functioning is the same, he's lost a lot of content. He's lost a lot of what he's learned. So he has to go back to high school. I think this is the only example of a modern science fiction novel about what schooling looks like in the near future. And if I describe it for you in the abstract, you'd recognize much of it project-based learning, distributed collaboration, the use of social media, even the use of drones uh, for building uh, class projects. The book also has a really funny, I thought, parody of Google book scanning, uh, which I, I won't describe here, along with a parody of Harry Potter. Um, but I, that's one that I would strongly recommend to anyone uh, in academia. Um, beyond, that, that's the one I would, I, would, okay. I would throw out there for now. That, that's, a, that's a wonderful book, um, and I actually have uh, heard him speak about that a few times. Oh, uh, He's good. delightful on it. Oh, um, I just put as a footnote, though, I think that's 2010 or so. That's, that's older than you think. That, this is what surprised me was, um, you know, I, I could come up with ones like that that you know, within recent time period, but not in the last year or so. Yeah, uh, the last year or so. No, I, I'd be hard pressed to see when that really affected my understanding of the future. That's uh, interesting. Most, again, we, we, we are very much enthralled with destroying the present. Um, and uh, building a nice future is harder and harder I, to I do. I had not thought about the offsetting, you know, um, theme of, of apocalypse and uh, deterioration um, and of course, zombies. And well, there is a positive. There is a positive way out. Um, there's some of you may know this. An Australian science fiction classic, uh, written by Sean McMullen, uh, called Eyes of the Calculor. Anyone here remember this? It was based on the idea that the apocalypse has come, the world has been destroyed, but in Australia, who rebuilds? Mm -hmm. Of well, librarians, <laughs> organized into feudal orders. You know, the reference group, <laughs> serialist group. And they're armed to the teeth, and they fight duels of honor with each other. And I remember the, the, when this hit the ALA, people were like, this is awesome. You know? so, so there is a way forward. There is a way for, It's violent, but there is a way forward. Okay. Love it. That title again? Eyes of the Calculor. All right. You heard it here. Um, I think we should bring this to a close and let you have a short break and get to your next session. Great. Um, those who have questions or comments that they want to get into the mix, please um, join us at five and we'll pick it up from there. Great. And uh, join me now in thanking Brian for a really oh, stimulating uh, conversation. That was fun. Thank you. We'll see you on